um, get a message saying you have to accept the recording and that's because of privacy issues. If you don't wish to be seen in the video, please turn off your video because we will be putting it on social media. And um, we will give a few minutes for people to join in. In the meantime, do use the chat section to tell us who you are, where you're joining in from, and what is the work you do, what brings you to this session. We are very excited for this session and we hope you are excited too. So my name is Elsa Marie De Silva. I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation, also known as Safe City. I'm based in Mumbai, India, and we work on sexual and gender-based violence prevention. Safe City is a reporting platform where we encourage people to share their anonymous stories of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. This is plotted on a map as hotspots, visualized as hotspots, so that you can see and it's, it makes an invisible problem visible. The reason I started this about eight and a half years ago was to break the silence around the issue, to bridge the data gap that exists between daily reality that many of us face and the underreported official statistics. And today we are very pleased to be uh, sharing the insights from our social audit that we did last year. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but we are also pleased to partner with Safe City Malaysia Partners, which is a Sisterhood Alliance and Engender Consultancy. So thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here. Great. So there's uh, colleagues from Hidden Pockets Collective. Great. Uh, we also have Justin from UNICEF Office of Innovation. Uh, amazing, happy to have you here. I know a lot of people uh, have come in from different parts of the world and we are very excited. So just to give you a sense of what we are going to do today, I'm going to start off with a 10 minute presentation on the social audit insights. And then uh, Lisa from Engender will share their survey results, which they presented in November, but which I thought were very relevant to the discussion. And then we have two guests, Bi Ling Ong and uh, Esra Al Shafai. And uh, we will have a discussion on, of course, using data and technology to end gender based violence. So, without further ado, I'm going to start by introducing our speakers today. So, we have Miss Lisa Marie Fernandez who will present the background and key findings of the National Survey on Sexual Harassment in Public Spaces in Malaysia. She is Engender Consultancy's Advocacy and Operations Associate, focusing on project management and coordination. She is also co-secretariat of Malaysia's first anti-modern slavery coalition of civil society organizations joining hands against modern slavery. We have Ms. Bi Leng Ong, who is the CEO of Penang Women's Development Corporation, which is a government-linked company of the Penang State Government. Other than being the implementation arm of gender-related state policies, PWDC focuses on programs in women's empowerment and leadership. Bi Leng will present their initiatives on domestic violence and their flagship program, Gender Responsive and Participatory Budgeting, which is based on data and evidence-based policy making. Our fourth speaker is Esra al Shafe, who is a Bahraini human rights activist and founder of Majal.org, a network of digital platforms that amplify underrepresented and marginalized voices. These platforms include Mideast Tunes, the largest platform for regional underground musicians who use music as a tool for advocacy, Avaz.org, a bilingual tool for LGBTQ youth in the Arab world that leverages game mechanics to protect and engage its community, and migrantrights.org, the primary resource on the plight of migrant workers in the Gulf. I shall put these chat links a little later, so do check all the websites. And um, with that, I am going to share my screen and begin 
the presentation of our social audit. So this study was done by Develop Matrix and Lata Shankar Narayan is present here. This was commissioned by Vital Voices, uh, an organization that both Radzia from Sisterhood Alliance and I are part of. And this uh, particular project was un commissioned under the Vi Voices Against Violence program, which is a US State Department initiative. And really the study, the aim of the study was to address the estimated extent of sexual violence in cities that are more exposed to the use of safe city apps in India. So the study focused on urban areas, not rural areas, which is a whole different ballgame when we talk about technology and uh, apps for reporting. And the objective was to identify and understand the Indian scenario concerning the cultural, social, historical, and legal dimensions, as well as how citizens perceive sexual violence and then use these learnings to upgrade our app which we did through the pandemic last year and also think of new engagement strategies that we can use so in total we had about 302 people that responded to the uh, survey and the focus group discussions most of them were from uh, the big cities in India, Mumbai, of course, 46%, followed by Bangalore and Delhi. Uh, we did not focus on rural areas for this survey. Most of them were graduates or postgraduates. So that means they were educated and had access to digital devices. Because as you know, access to digital devices is a different uh, topic completely. Many people are left out due to the digital divide that exists. So we, this was a very targeted study based on these parameters. And 73% uh, of our uh, respondents were female and 79% uh, um, you know, um, were women. The age group, of course, was uh, mainly young people, but we had 29% in the age group 45 to 55 years and 28% who were youth. 18 to 25, and then of course, um, you know, a fair representation in 25 to 35 years, and then 35 to 45 years. A lot of them were, uh, they worked. So when we say service in India means they have a job and 26% uh, were self-employed while 21% were students. And what we realized is that when we spoke about sexual violence, the term sexual violence was recognized, but actually uh, it was used in a very broad based sense. They did not fully understand the spectrum of abuse that constitutes sexual violence. And a lot of it was clustered under something in India we call as Eve teasing. So an Eve, te Eve teasing is like acceptable, it's become so normalized that people do not think that it is a problem to report. So as you can see that um, many people did actually um, say that, you know, they were, um, they had experienced these different forms of it, making passes, uh, they were, they were recipients of people making passes or whistling or staring, or they um, received, um, you know, people pinch them or fondle them, or they were sent porn, or they were recipients of sexually oriented materials, things like that. So what is, when we asked them, what was the perception of sexual violence? A lot of the respondents said that it was because people wanted to show power control or their manhood, or it was just their bullying nature. And otherwise they, said it was lust or strong sexual urges, which was interesting because um, this we believe stems from the media portrayal in Bollywood, you know, how uh, people, um, you know, express themselves. And then the other one was, uh, the other high one, the 53.8% was, it's an accepted social norm, boys will uh, indulge in this kind of behavior and one has to ignore, which is hugely troubling, but not um, surprising in a way. Uh, there was also 
the need to take revenge, which was also hugely troubling because in my country, uh, many young women are uh, recipients of acid attacks. So what is the effect of sexual violence when we ask them? Uh, many of them said that it affects mental health, which is hardly spoken about, for example, um, followed by they feel unsafe, afraid, embarrassed, and humiliated. It leads to depression and suicidal thoughts. And how do they deal with it? They avoid going out and avoid the place of harassment. And that we anyway knew because we limit our behavior, we limit our mobility, and thereby our opportunities. And this is not surprising because when you look at the statistics of women's participation in the formal labor force in India, it is at its lowest at anywhere between uh, 20 to 25 percent, depending on the study, uh, the latest studies during COVID, because a lot of uh, women drop out simply because the perception of safety in public spaces is one of the factors that um, when they reach a certain level, they do not want to deal with. They want to stay safe, so they self-censor, or their families restrict their movements under the guise of safety. When we asked them, have you experienced sexual violence? A lot of them said no, but when we asked the, the other question, did you witness it? And many, 62% or more said yes. And again, based on the workshops that we have done for 30,000 people, we know that actually sometimes it is they themselves who are experiencing it, but they don't have the confidence to say it. So often when somebody says they've witnessed it, maybe it's also they have experienced it. And when we ask them who, you know, what was the perpet uh, perpetrator's gender? In most cases, it was men, 80%. And many also said um, young men. And these percentages may not add up to 100% because they had multiple choices. Where did these incidents happen. A lot of it happened in public spaces such as railway stations, trains, metros, bus stops, parks, and general streets. Um, it also happened in, um, you know, the workplace and the office, the food stalls, the college canteens, and the corner of the street or the residence building. And that to me was also very interesting because uh, there's another study by the Royal Institute of Technology Stockholm where uh, they analyzed where women get harassed and it's within 500 meters between the home and the bus stop or the transport station. So in our survey, uh, when we asked them witnessing, a lot of them witnessed it, but here almost 50% said they had um, experienced it, but there was more that said that they did not experience it. So we have to go by what they say, but in reality, uh, you know, even through our workshops, what we realized is when they understand the spectrum of abuse and the different categories that there are, many people then change their, uh, um, you know, response that they have experienced it. Also, what kinds did they face? They faced physical uh, street harassment, like making passes, whistling, staring comments, followed by pinching, fondling, rubbing against one's body or groping, uh, making passes, whistling, staring, and obscene gestures, stalking. So these were like the most common ones. And how, how did they respond to it? The majority tried to fight back alone with support of friends and bystanders. Um, Many of them just ignored it. That's like a huge amount of almost 40%, which means that we must invest in bystander training. Uh, some of them, 23% approached legal entities like police, government authorities, and NGOs, and the rest shared it on social media. And who did they go to share it with? A large part went to a family friend or a family, a family member or a friend. And Currently, we are investing in a lot of training on cyber Sathi, Sathi being friend. And uh, the training is on uh, how do you deal with online harassment, how you recognize it, identify it, and prevent it, and respond to it. And we are training young people to be 
equipped to be first responders because this 80% actually go to a friend or a family member. So one really needs to invest in that because even if it didn't happen to you, somebody you know has, has experienced or witnessed it and you can help them. Reasons for not reporting, um, the top reason is feeling shame, guilt, defamation of the family name. Honor is a huge thing in India, followed by hopelessness. Hopelessness that nothing would happen to the perpetrator because they don't uh, believe in the system. So there's very low trust. Uh, fear of the chances of marriage getting ruined or breakup of marriage. And this I witnessed firsthand in my own uh, team. You know, even though we work on sexual violence, when it comes to them, they don't necessarily also want to report because they are not yet married and their family might not feel comfortable them reporting. And then followed closely with fear of stigmatization by society and so on and so forth. Who to report to first? Again, uh, it was important to ask these questions because, you know, reporting in the formal system is very, very poor, right? So a lot of people knew where to report, but 42% uh, said they went to the police station. So there's, no, 42% said they went to an NGO. You know, the police are still not that uh, high up on their list to go and report to. So that means we need to equip NGOs as well to know what are the laws and how, what is the reporting process and to help them in the whole uh, journey with the survivor of reporting. The next biggest one is a legal aid and a lawyer. And when, we, when it comes to technology, these are people who anyway had uh, devices and the use of apps, uh, but their awareness regarding technology to report sexual violence almost 70% said they were not aware of it. And tech as an aid for um, sexual violence, would they use it? 75% said they would use it, which was encouraging. So they weren't aware of uh, a lot of the text, uh, the apps available, but they said that they would use it. And uh, what channels they preferred would be, of course, the mobile followed by the website. So that was encouraging for those who plan to, um, you know, create apps. It's, so when we asked them, and this was mainly prompted, a lot of this was based on brand recognition. Half these apps don't even exist today, but they still had brand recall value. Um, so safe city, so the highest was VSafe, but VSafe does not exist anymore. So that means even, Safe City app, which had a high recollection amongst the top apps, still needed to be marketed. And so the conclusion really from this audit is that the availability of tech applications continues to be underutilized. We, and it's true because for every dollar spent on the development of the app, we need to spend at least $100 on education, not only on the issue, but also how to use this app. And but tech applications appeal to a captive audience, mainly young people under the age of 35. Uh, so safe city is not only feasible, but also essential for the community and reporting of cases of uh, sexual violence. The data definitely indicates there's a lack of knowledge of the various uh, acts. That means the various categories of sexual violence, as well as the laws. In India, we have all the laws, but the knowledge of the laws and implementation of the laws is poor. And how can one be a better bystander? So that's also something that uh, we can invest in. It also highlights a lack of knowledge of apps and technology that can assist. And um, it validates that a lot of programming, community-based programming is effective. So uh, we at Safe City have an online offline model where we partner with local nonprofits on the ground. And, working in tandem with them where we integrate the technology in their programming and also give them access to the data so that they can utilize the insights that emerge from the data set again to find solutions has been very effective and student programming on college campuses uh, has been very effective in raising awareness as well as in um, bringing about um, solutions.
So I'm going to stop over there and uh, we can have a discussion later on uh, your thoughts around it. I want to hand it over to Lisa, who will um, share the survey results from their uh, study that they did last year. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. All right, um, Samriti, if you could just help me to share the presentation. Thank you. All right, so um, it was interesting, uh, Elsa, listening to you because, yeah, it's the first time actually that, you know, we are also um, learning the findings from your social audit and there's so many, I mean, everyone here, you will see that actually there are a lot of similarities in the questions and some of the findings that we had from our survey. So um, just to introduce about our survey, this was a national survey that was conducted by Engender Consultancy and Sisterhood Alliance. It was done last year over a three uh, month period from July to September. Uh, our intention was to use this data to provide evidence of sexual harassment, specifically in public spaces, and to work with local government and other stakeholders to develop solutions in cities. Um, before I, I go into it, I just want to say that we're proud to actually share that we are now working with local government, uh, specifically uh, in Pataling Jaya and other stakeholders as part of our pilot initiative for the Safe City campaign. Next. Okay, so just to give you an overview of the survey, there were four main parts to this survey, which included collecting data on the demographic profile of respondents, uh, respondents' direct experience as victims and survivors of sexual harassment in public spaces here in Malaysia, uh, respondents' indirect experience, meaning whether they knew of or heard or witnessed someone who had experienced it. Uh, lastly, uh, we have Have Your Say, which is about recommendations that the respondents both selected and suggested. Next. Okay, so um, in total, we received uh, 654 responses. Majority of them uh, were from women, 80%. We res received responses from all age groups, uh, majority comprising older teenagers and young working adults from below 18 up to 34 years old, followed by 34 to 49, 35 to 49 years old, 45 to 59, and also those above 60. Uh, most respondents were Malaysian citizens. Uh, there was quite a diverse ethnic background. Most were Malay, followed by Chinese, uh, Indian, also indigenous, and others which included Malaysians and non-Malaysians. 1% uh, of our respondents were persons with disabilities. Next. Okay, so what we mm -hmm. found was 59% of respondents reported that they had personally experienced sexual harassment in public spaces. Um, and there are a few things that we wish to, to highlight here. One is the age range of respondents. Um, you can see from the chart that no one is exempt. Uh, those affected were as young as uh, children from the category below 18, a large proportion of youth and right up to the older population. Um, secondly, we often discuss uh, the issue in the context of women's experience because they make up majority of victims and survivors of gender-based violence, including sexual harassment. Um, but this is clearly not exclusive to them, right? It is something that men experience too, and no matter how few, it is still one too many. The third point we wish to make is uh, the number of times or the frequency at which respondents experienced it. So uh, from among the women in blue, uh, 105 women experienced it once. 167 experienced sexual harassment two to five times. Uh, 87 women experienced it more than five times. Among the men, 11 reported experiencing it once. 10 men had experienced it two to five times. And three experienced it more than five times. So if we want to look at the number of incidents based on the 383 people's experience here, it would actually amount to at least 1,000 times. Um, and so you know, this alone underscores the seriousness of the issue. Next. All right, on this slide um, is data on those who had reported another person's experience, either they heard about it or they witnessed it take place. So we found that 60% of our respondents um, had, had witnessed or heard about it, out of which uh, 221 said they knew someone who ex experienced sexual harassment in a public space, 53 said they had witnessed it, uh, on top of that, another 116 said they both knew of someone and have witnessed it take place. 
All right, so when did the sexual harassment occur? 70% um, of those who personally experienced sexual harassment indicated they were sexually harassed during the daytime, which is contrary to popular, popular belief that it occurs predominantly at night. Um, in terms of public spaces uh, and places that it occurred, uh, public transport ranked the highest. Uh, in our survey, we listed examples such as you know, in, on taxis, in taxis, buses, uh, on trains, boats, planes even. Um, this was followed by walkways, common public areas, which included lobbies or reception areas, car parks, canteens, etc. Um, in buildings such as offices, schools, hospitals. Um, this was followed by shopping areas such as malls, markets, and shops. Um, it happened while they were on the road, at bus and taxi stands, also on public online spaces. So these can be on social media or online forums. Um, it also took place in bars, uh, restaurants, cafes, in playgrounds, um, and also public service places, which refers to your banks, your post offices, libraries. Um, it also happened in places of worship and community halls and sports centers. Next. Okay, so in terms of the indirect experience, so the respondents that were reporting on someone else's experience, overall, it's quite similar, the, the findings, um, except for a notable difference. If you can see where public online spaces are concerned, it came third, it ranked third here um, compared to 11th for the direct experience. Next. So this word cloud shows the 10 most frequently mentioned locations. Um, and uh, you can see that the bigger the word, that means that it, it happened more frequently in that, in that area. So here you can see KL, um, PJ, Pataling Jaya, Kuching, um, KK, and, and others. We also decided um, that to list, you know, the almost 70 locations across Malaysia where it occurred, just to show how widespread this issue is, and it's in urban and rural areas. Um, and, you know, and this is just what our respondents reported, you know, like Elsa was saying that, and, and, and that we know generally, there is so much underreporting, um, you know, so what about the many more unreported cases that are not um, reflected, you know, in our survey findings? Um, all right, in terms of the type of sexual harassment uh, that they experienced, uh, victims and survivors experienced, a third of them um, experienced physical and verbal forms of sexual harassment, and around a fifth nonverbal and visual, you know, so and except for physical instances in this regard, all of these forms can actually happen online. And I just like to note that in our survey, we, um, you know, how Elsa had had highlighted earlier that, you know, many did not report that they personally experienced sexual har harassment, but uh, in many cases, they, they would have, it's just that they didn't um, have the vocabulary or they didn't know the spectrum of gender-based violence or sexual harassment. And so what we did uh, to aid our respondents' responses was to include um, examples of what constituted, you know, physical uh, sexual harassment, for example, unwelcome touching, kissing, uh, invasion of personal space, um, and obviously the more, more severe um, rape or attempted rape. Uh, in terms of verbal, it could comprise sexist remarks, um, sexual or gender-based jokes, uh, whistling, requesting sexual flavors, even spreading rumors. Um, in terms of what constitutes nonverbal uh, harassment, it would be like staring, sizing up a person's body, um, and gestures of a sexual nature. So we would all be familiar with the term flashing, right? Uh, the last would be visual. So this would mean unwanted images, messages, or objects of a sexual nature. Next. We too looked into uh, the profile of the perpetrators. Um, here we are showing you the findings of those who, who personally experienced it. So um, this shows the identity of perpetrators and their relation to the victim. It's not clear cut whether the person in authority are known to the victims or strangers, but even if we make the assumption that they are strangers, we still find that a majority of them were known to the victim. Um, in terms of the sex breakdown, a uh, majority were male, 95%. Um, and majority of the perpetrators were of the opposite sex, approximately 90%, with same-sex perpetrators comprising um, approximately 10%. Next. 
Okay, so in terms of whether um, action was taken uh, and what kind of action was taken, only uh, just over half of those who were sexually harassed in public took action. Um, and this is really concerning. We need to ask ourselves why people do not take action. And, and Elsa, you know, touched on it um, in, in depth earlier. You know, and we also have to ask whether we have the necessary and effective systems and structures in place for prevention and support to victims and survivors. Um, so here, most of them uh, had informed someone. Uh, the examples we gave in the survey were maybe a trusted friend or a family member. Um, only 6% reported to an internal person in charge of sexual harassment in the relevant organization. Um, even less, uh, around 4% reported to public authorities. So this could include your local council or um, police. Uh, some confronted the perpetrator while uh, others took other action. Next. So we also asked those who had um, heard about it take place or witnessed it take place uh, to find out whether they took action um, as, as a bystander. Um, and although there is no definitive figure here, it is safe to assume that um, most who had heard about or witnessed someone being sexually harassed took action, um, which is encouraging. Uh, the main type of action taken included intervening in the situation. Um, some uh, specified that they confronted the perpetrator. Um, others included supporting the survivor, which included um, encouraging them to make a report, giving emotional support, um, consoling them, giving counseling, and also just sharing general advice. Uh, some posted about it on social media, they took legal action. Um, some even mentioned that they did sexual harassment training and even set up a code of conduct in, uh, in their community um, and a safe space to talk about issues and experiences. And um, next. In terms of why action was not taken, um, here we actually just decided to include um, anecdotes and quotes, you know, because sometimes when we're looking at stats, you know, it, these are people's um, lived experience, right? It, these are real to them. And uh, just showing figures sometimes doesn't really do it just, do them justice. And, and to really um, get a sense of, you know why they didn't take action. Um, the main reasons victims did not take action were due to a lack of trust in the justice system, that sexual harassment is normalized. There was a lot of self-blame. And also some were just a minor at the time. They were too young to really realize or it happened too quickly and they didn't know how to respond. And, and these are things that you know came up in um, Elsa's social audit as well or in safe cities. In terms of indirect experience, so some of the reasons bystanders or those who had heard about the incident did not take action because they were afraid to. They also felt it was normalized. Um, they felt helplessness. Um, they too were minors at the time. Um, and also in some instances, it was because the victim did not want to take action. Um, in other cases, it was because they were not on site when it did happen. Next. We also uh, asked the uh, victims and survivors what support they received. And thankfully around 61% said that they received support. Um, two thirds of them mostly got support from inner circle, so friends and family. 11% had support from internal uh, organizations in terms of, for example, counseling. Uh, only around 8% received bystander support though, and others were aided by NGOs and government agencies. Next. So finally, looking at the impact of this experience on affected individuals' lives, um, they had a heightened awareness um, and insecurity when going out, uh, and also especially in the presence of men of the opposite sex. Um, there were, their mental health was affected, their social life, um, this included depression, you know, feeling low self-esteem, having flashbacks of the incident, increased anxiety and fear in general, um, and also trauma. Um, in terms of uh, how the, they also had physical intimacy issues, um, behaviorally, they, some said that they became more aggressive or assertive. Um, you know, I, these are kinds of coping mechanisms, right? Um, they became more steely or they just ignored and avoided people, especially men. Um, in terms of their day-to-day -day life, some stopped taking uh, certain forms of public transport. Uh, in one instance, it was very um, extreme. That person actually had to move out of their own uh, residential area to avoid um, the perpetrator. 
Um, many others have adopted coping strategies, such as always trying to be with a friend, um, especially maybe a male friend, or they just try to be, a, just as long as they avoid being alone, um, or they'll try to keep a distance, they'll be more alert, and also are ready to um, practice self-defense if, if needed. So um, I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, this was an eye-opener even for us, you know, although in some ways, these overall findings um, may not come as an entire shock given what we already know about the pervasive issue of sexual harassment. But from these findings and also, you know, Safe Cities uh, social audit, we can just see how widespread the issue of sexual harassment in public spaces is. And it really calls for an urgency in action from the federal level right down to the local government and community. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This was really really interesting because it it's so similar right and um, what i was thinking is that it makes a case for education education at all levels education for uh, you know people to recognize the spectrum of abuse but also to um, invest in other people's actions like bystanders you may not be a perpetrator you but you may be a silent bystander so how can we change that dynamic because what is happening on a normalized basis is all these different forms of verbal nonverbal, touching groping stalking showing pornography and it becomes normalized over a period of time and then acceptable behavior making it really hard uh, for people to speak up and challenge the status quo but on the other hand it also contributes to this insecure culture where the onus is on the victim to continue to prove the innocence and prove that the crime happened and nobody else in the system really wants to do anything about it so thank you so much i found both your survey also very interesting and i've heard it before but now i'm looking at it in view of our survey so it was it was great so uh, our next speaker i'm going to invite b leng to share on her work and how they use data and tech in gender responsive participatory budgeting. Over to you, B. Thank you, Elsa. Uh, good evening, fellow panelists, friends. I've seen, I see some of you in here. Good evening to all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, even the gentleman who's actually in this conversation. Yeah. Um, what I try to do is to share a bit more of uh, what we call the gender responsive and participatory budgeting. Uh, the whole idea is actually to, to also give a perspective when we address uh, issues of DV and even gender issues, uh, how then, you know, can what, what method or what uh, tools can we use uh, when we talk to the government? So GRPB, the gender responsive and participatory budgeting is the methodology uh, that uh, we have been using in Penang. So it started back in 2012, uh, and we it was actually through a smart partnership with the Penang Local Councils, uh, that is the MBPP and MBSP. Um, back then, when we started, uh, we started as a GRB, and then we found the need to have participation of the community itself. So we we it was an adoption of a GRB and a G, uh, and a PB together. Uh, and we came up with what we call the GRPB, the Penang model. Now we know budget impacts women, girls, boys, and men differently because their needs are different according to their sex, their age, their income, their education, even their capabilities. GRPB then is a smart and sustainable budget allocation methodology yeah, to better meet the community's needs uh, as we know different people have different needs. Yeah. GRPB also ensures that no one is left behind. Okay, And this is again aligned to the UN SDG. So maybe let me briefly explain uh, what is GRPB. GRPB makes budgets. So we, we, we actually went down to the ground, to the, uh, to the government to explain to them the importance of GRPB and make everybody understand the importance of budget and also by encouraging the greater community participation. In GRPB, data is collected and analyzed according to gender group, uh, what we know as the sex disaggregated data or SDD. 
which is a key step in implementing and monitoring GRPB. It also incorporates uh, gender analysis and participation into the stages of the budget cycle. Uh, from the specific, from the specific uh, perspective of different gender groups. From our experience, data collection, I'm not too sure whether in, in, in Penang, I, I think it could be across the world, that data collection is not a key competency, okay, even among the officers in the public sector. So uh, from our experience, uh, when we started, we have to even start from the very basic uh, start to ask them to collect data based on sex, okay? Male, female, start with that. And then we evolve on to, okay, please include also their age. And then we look into the uh, uh, social economic uh, status and all that. So that's how we started to evolve. And we find that slowly as we ask them to collect more data, they found that eh, it's actually not so difficult. And then we also tell them, you know, that well, data is again based on the purpose of the uh, project. So with this slow adoption, not turning them off, that really works. We see the change actually in the local uh, councils when they implemented the GRPB over the years. So imagine 2012 and we're already in the 10 years. So it is a slow but steady transformation. Currently, Budget dialogue. So when uh, in Penang, we have budget dialogue. So this is where the local councils uh, go out and talk to the people. They have uh, dialogue with the people and then they conduct budget surveys. Uh, and importantly, when they do the collection, they also make sure that it's a fair representation of women and men. So they have inculcated this uh, culture of making sure when they collect data, they must have representation. So it cannot be just data from the men because we also need to hear the voices of the women too. Uh, even in the focus group discussion, uh, we also see the implementation of whereby they form groups, you know. So they have young girls, young boys, the adult women, adult men, the senior citizens, the disabled, and even children. They are then segregated in groups because we know that if women come together with men, it is always, it is most of the time, if not all, that the men's voices are louder and you don't hear the women's voices. And that's the reason we segregate them. And, and then we go deep into the issues of women, even in the different age group. The in-depth discussion uh, uh, was, was uh, conducted and we collected data uh, on community issues, including DV. Okay, so this is when we, we, we group them with the women and all that, then they raise up issues, you know, domestic violence, uh, social issues, uh, community cleanliness. So all these issues uh, crop up, uh, but the focus group discussion doesn't just focus on issue. We also look for solutions. We find that most of the time, the community already have the solution. It's just that they, they need a, a, a platform to raise it out and also the, the solutions can be discussed and all that. So we found that the focus group discussion was very, really powerful. So then with this information that we've gathered with the data that we have, then we bring it to the authority, the people who has the money, who has the budget. Because as, as we know, uh, no money, no talk. So we really need people who has the budget, who has the money to ensure that this money and this budget is spent according to the needs of the community. So that was how the whole process of the GRPB works. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, GRPB is, is not a, it's not having a separate budget for men and women. It doesn't mean that we must have a budget for men and for women. No, does it? require additional funds, no. But instead, it focuses on gender equity, okay, in the redistribution of funds within the fiscal space. That is what GRPP is about, right? Thus, we see the importance of SDD uh, and of course, gender analysis in GRPB uh, to ensure the budget is allocated based on the needs in closing the gender gaps. Yeah, over back to you, Elsa. Thank you so much for sharing that because uh, in India, we have the Nirbhaya Fund, which 
came up after the horrific gang rape and it's still lying underutilized, you know. So it's not that there's not enough money or funding available. It's really how it is being used. And if communities and citizens have a say in how it is used, honestly, you know, if it is there, it should be used. So thank you for sharing your work. And now I'd like to invite Ezra to share on how digital access and rights is important for the LGBTQ plus community. Over to you, Ezra. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, as you may know, um, I come from Bahrain and um, I felt uh, compelled to do something about the um, injustices that surrounds me for, um, you know, since my childhood basically. So like many countries in the Middle East, um, Bahrain is also a country with high surveillance and censorship. So every step I took had to be with extreme caution. Hence, for example, um, I'm not on video to protect my physical anonymity um, and also um, as a way for, to enable me to more safely continue my human rights work. So about 15 years ago, I founded an organization called Majal.org. Um, and Majal is an organization which develops platforms that amplify underrepresented voices in the MENA region. So it's, it's run pri uh, primarily by um, Arab women and our projects are diverse in scope, but all of them connect back to the um, organization's core mission of increasing freedom of expression and access to information. Um, so this work includes Midi's Tunes, a platform for um, independent musicians in the region who use music as a tool for social justice advocacy. Because for us, um, music is more than just a creative outlet. It functions as a social tool that amplifies the voices of marginalized communities in a way that transforms um, established narratives of the region. So in climates that are rife with uh, censorship and uh, in particular state-sponsored uh, propaganda, where many forms of communication are monitored and suppressed. Um, independent music presents a unique means for self-expression, uh, self um, but also advocacy for gender equity and justice. So a lot of the artists, for example, are women, and you will find things like, um, you know, hip hop songs or metal songs by women about street harassment and dignity anywhere from Egypt to Iran. Um, so we also run ahwat.org and um, Ahwa is actually the Arabic word for passions. And for the last decade, it has served as a support network um, and uh, online discussion tool for the, um, for the Arab LGBTQ community, uh, especially youth. And this platform leverages game mechanics to protect and engage this community. Um, because, you know, when it comes to this community, as you may be aware, this is a region where it, this community is severely underrepresented and face not only systematic repression, but also discrimination, um, marginalization and persecution. So especially amongst youth um, in the Gulf who are members of this community, um, there was a sense of extreme fear, isolation, uh, distance, depression. And as a result, many place themselves at risk by resorting to unsecure tools, such as public chat rooms that aren't encrypted or using platforms that aren't really built or designed with the local context in mind. Um, and so that risk could lead to horrific consequences. So we built Ahwa um, to address these challenges. And to date, we have over um, 10,000 members. And um, the way we use game mechanics is that each time you provide you know, helpful insights, you gain more points. And based on these points, you basically gain access to more resources and parts of the site um, that require a bit more trustworthiness. And this helps us deal with the issue of trolling, um, harassment, and abuse. And it's also for the community to sustain itself through this environment rather than requiring ongoing moderation, which is both exhausting um, and also could be potentially costly. Um, and of course it can lead to other security risks. Um, so, um, you know, this was just a way for us to ensure that people can engage with a sense of more security um, and, uh, you know, the access they can gain is anything from, you know, uh, chat rooms to private discussion pages that require a bit more um, 
a deeper safety net, basically anything from health issues to legal issues to request for urgent aid um, if somebody is in immediate risk in their countries, for example. Um, because of the context in which we work, we required more unique ways of circumventing censorship and preserving personal safety through these types of creative and sometimes artistic means. Um, and that's why we turn to music and gamifying some of our advocacy efforts to protect ourselves and our community. Um, we found that it was very important for us to leverage technology um, to address these crucial social and political issues um, of the region, um, it basically in ways that sometimes are maybe unconventional or unexpected, because it also helps us fly a bit under the radar um, while still delivering um, the impact that we want to see in, in our um, communities. Um, and to me, that's really the power and influence that technology can have on underrepresented communities. It's just finding new ways to engage in a meaningful way without compromising on the uh, anonymity required to protect ourselves and each other, but still feeling a part of um, a supportive network and being able to securely and efficiently access on the ground resources that might be critical. Um, again, it might be you know health, legal, or urgent protection from a uh, dangerous situation. Um, so I'll stop here and leave room for some of the other discussions. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, I I do feel that even in India, you know, we had uh, artists being put in jail for things that they have said. And art is such a powerful form to educate, to break the silence around issues to also uh, you know, help the general public who's not really working on these issues understand these issues. So um, thank you for your work. I um, would like to now start the panel uh, discussion. I have one question for everyone, but I would encourage you know, the, our audience to also add uh, your questions in the chat box for our speakers. So I'll start with Beeling. How can nonprofits like Engender and Sisterhood Alliance partner with local government to bring crowdsourced data to spotlight the issue, but also identify possible areas of collaboration? No, that's a very interesting question, Elsa. Um, maybe I just share an experience that we had recently because of this pandemic. Uh, Malaysia was uh, undergoing the movement uh, control order, which was imposed in eight, on the 18th of March, 2020. So at that time, there were many concerns about cases of uh, domestic violence. We know surely there could be a rise due to the stress in the family when people, uh, family are all confined at home. Later, there were mothers and fathers losing jobs, which created another level of stress in the family. Then we, we went to look at the statistics from the police. Let me share with you yeah, that the data from the police showed that the reported DV has declined 14% in the first five months into the MCO. We were thoroughly surprised. We wanted to believe that the statistic would say that MCO has reversed the DV occurrence. But deep down, we know that this is impossible. Data across the day, uh, globe is showing that the number has hiked tremendously. We found out that the statistic was low because actually victims were not able to come out to report. That is one key learning that I wanted to share that when we look at data, data need to be reviewed and taken into context and not just taken in the surveys. Yeah. Um, and from there, we also learned that uh, it was very difficult for DV victims to, to come out and then to get help or even to go to the police station or even go to any NGOs. We sat down and identified all these reasons and the challenges. And in this regard, I am proud to say that the Penang State Government decided on adopting a policy that is the safe family policy in 2020, which has a critical strategy. So this strategy is called the first support point. It is a place in the community itself where the victims can easily access to or go quickly and not to wander around for help. That is what was uh, then our objective. 
and I can say that um, in, in, in face of adversity, we find opportunities. And the second learning that we had was the importance of putting policies in place, especially when we interact with government. There must be a policy. And of course, to have an implementation and monitoring and evaluation agency. And that's where PwC's uh, role come in. We were then appointed to uh, implement and also to monitor. So it is not just a policy that is put up up there, but we also look into how to implement it and or to even monitor at this stage. Yeah? So with this safe family policy, uh, we then conduct uh, trainings for uh, the government agencies which have context with the community. So these are actually like the district office, uh, the, the, the council office, the service centers of the elected reps, NGOs. And what we are looking next is actually even the religious organizations such as the mosques, the surau, the temples, the churches, all close as close as possible to the community to be the first support point. The goal is to have a first support point, which is within the walking distance from any house. That is what we uh, um, set out to have, right? So we have been very fortunate to be able to engage in WC, the uh, women Center, who we have been working, uh, who of course WCC, uh, some of you may know, have been working on this issue uh, for, for 30 over years and working with WCC to come uh, together and provide capacity building for the offices or for the people who is uh, guiding or who is uh, be the support point for the victims. So the, the, the third learning is that strategic partnership. Don't do it alone. We have limited resources, government have limited resources. So does everybody. And I think particularly for NGO, look for strategic partnership, okay? So after all this, uh, of course, our moving forward plan is we wanted to venture into technology and put these support points on an app so that victims or friends or bystanders or, or whoever can turn on the app and find the nearest support point. Okay. I think you agree with me that um, it is actually important to strengthen the ecosystem to support DV victims. It takes collective effort. I think you also agree that it's from all levels of society. It's not just the government. It's not just the NGO. It could also the private sector and importantly, the community itself. The community must be empowered to do uh, you know, to even support this type of issues. We wanted to let the victims know that the community is behind them if they face domestic violence. After all, DV is not a family issue, but it's a public health issue. And thus, it concerns everyone, you and me. Thank you, Elsa. That was very powerful, and you're right. It's not a individual or a woman's issue but a societal issue and thinking about one-stop crisis centers in Bombay which is like a city of 22 million and more we have just two one-stop crisis centers for the whole city and one of them is named female beggars home which was really really shocking and as you know during uh, COVID the number of domestic violence cases increased tremendously and I could not even think of recommending someone to go there. So yeah, we definitely need to invest in a lot of these resources, but more importantly also invest within communities so that they can be first responders. I really love that. And Justin has asked if you can share in the chat section, the link to the family, safe family policy. I would also love to um, you know, access that. I wanted to ask Ezra, you already shared uh, many uh, different practical ways that you're helping your community but could you also share for more examples how we can leverage technology for gender justice 
Yes, um, sure. So for me, how we can leverage technology for gender justice is constantly researching and iterating um, how we can connect individuals to existing resources more effectively. Um, in the MENA region in particular, for example, many nonprofit organizations addressing uh, gender justice work um, they, they happen to operate in silos, uh, not by choice, but rather due to lack of capacity and resources to really bridge, uh, you know, uh, bridge those uh, gaps and connect those efforts in a holistic way that improves on their um, accessibility and, and even their um, security. So one thing is ensuring more resources are going towards these um, initiatives to encourage more innovation, um, a better digital presence, um, and, and just a way for them to advance their approach and collaboration um, more effectively. Um, I would say one example of an organization really um, attempting to do this uh, in their local context is the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, uh, founded by a lawyer and activist, Nigat Dutt, who created, amongst many other things within this field, uh, a cyber harassment helpline. So, you know, and they manage thousands of complaints, mostly by women, on how the sexual and physical violence they experience um, translates itself online and targets their digital identities. So they provide policy advocacies, um, you know, uh, resources, and also a lot of the times they provide um, or, or they themselves legally represent some of the women who come forward um, with these very serious complaints. Um, another example um, is that as technology advances, so do the um, sophistication of attacks. Unfortunately, you know, now we have the rise of deep fakes, um, trolls, um, and harassers abusing social media and search engine algorithms, manipulating uh, machine learning, uh, using encrypted technology for malicious attacks to avoid being caught, um, you know, and, and many other uh, challenges. So it's definitely an uphill battle and actually it's a very expensive battle as well. Um, and one organization to look up to on this is the um, Algorithmic um, Justice League and using, um, you know, their data and advocacy on racist and sexist algorithms in big tech and applying that to gender justice initiatives. So basically finding better ways to hold the companies that enable this abuse um, accountable and calling them out for whenever they are complicit due to inaction. And this especially becomes risky when it comes to society's normalization of uh, surveillance technology, you know, um, including Alexa, Google Home, many others have actually been found to sometimes be used against victims and survivors rather than in their favor. So how to um, tools get built to escape that ongoing surveillance and curation and storage of data, often without our consent, in a way that's both subtle, um, you know, and respectful, uh, respectful of our privacy to avoid it from basically being used against us. So I don't have an answer, obviously, to some of those, but these are the kinds of challenges that keep many of us, you know, up at night, basically. So as much as we want to leverage technology, uh, we have to build with the awareness that technology is also being used against us. Um, and sometimes the more we innovate, the more we have to dismantle other innovations that harm us. And the more we try to um, make resources more accessible, um, the more we face attempts to silence and censor you know, that effort. So I think it will be an ongoing um, iteration, but more importantly, it has to be a cross-border collaboration for a lot of these types of, um, of creations. Thank you so much for those insights. And uh, earlier today, I had a similar panel on the use of technology to address gender-based violence at Grace Hopper, India. And uh, they were a bunch of technologists and data analysts. And I was talking to them about how you can have ethical tech and inclusive tech. And so I'm going to take uh, Manu's question. Manu is from Hidden Pockets. And he asked, how do, you, and it's addressed to me, how do you take care of the privacy and safety of people who report sexual violence, especially in India when victims are tracked and harassed in forms of more rape, threats, or acid attacks? So our platform doesn't require you to name yourself. We don't collect any personal information. In fact, we have deliberately designed it to not even collect IP addresses. The only personal information we collect is age and uh, gender. So apart from that, we don't collect anything. Um, 
we also screen every report before we approve it before it goes onto the front end so any personal information is removed and that's how we ensure the privacy of the person we are not looking necessarily at individual reports people who need individual help write to us directly at uh, red dot foundation for help uh, what we are collecting is a data set where we look at patterns and trends that are emerging at the localized level, so disaggregated data by location, and then trying to find solutions based on the top three data trends that emerge and uh, trying to find solutions for that. So I hope I've answered your question, but I'm going to direct your next question, Manu, to Lisa, which uh, also relates to uh, privacy. Can you please throw some more light on the research methodology and approach used to interview kids under 18 in the context of sexual violence and also about the data privacy and legality of the research? Yeah, so um, essentially we conducted this survey online, um, just very simple format with Google Forms. Um, we circulated it with our networks um, and as I was going to just share later on as well, uh, you know, with CSOs, um, civil society organizations and NGOs within the country to also share with their communities. So we didn't have any direct um, contact, you know, with, with the respondents. Uh, in terms of the privacy and confidentiality, we did mention in our introduction, we did highlight that, you know, we understand it's firstly, an, it, it's an uncomfortable process, it can be, and uh, but we appreciate their courage to respond um, to their best ability, because with their help, um, the more data we get, the better we can tackle the issue. So, so first we acknowledged, you know, that that this is a process that they are going through, but also we did say that participation is voluntary um, and all personal information would be kept confidential because um, as you saw earlier, we only are using aggregated data. So we don't have any personal information. Um, the other thing is that at the very end of the survey, uh, after thanking them, we did also provide them a resource to that we encourage them to just um, open and save and keep on hand with them uh, because we, we basically explain, you know, sexual harassment can have both a short-term and long-term negative impacts. Um, and we recognize that them doing this survey can, you know, inevitably it may bring up uh, bad feelings, thoughts, um, and it, it can really range depending on that person's experience. So we, we shared this resource file with them with some code, coping strategies and helplines as well. And I hope that answers your question. So I'm going to add over here, our new version of the Safe City reporting platform also has an empathy layer built in. Uh, so the way it's designed is, because one of the feedback that we got in the earlier version of it was that even if it is anonymous reporting, it's a very lonely journey to report it because it triggers memories and you just feel um, alone. So what we've done is through the design of the app where the colors being used the single questions slight nudges and uh customized for you know the customized questions like just like you know you would uh, walk your friend through an incident like that so constant reassurance and at the very end help related to the category that is being reported so for example if I pick stalking as the category, then at the very end, it will give me the Indian penal code for stalking. Should I want to go to the police station? It has a tab says, uh, check the nearest police station, check the nearest hospital. These are the helplines. And we've mapped it to all the countries as well where we have partners. So similar for Malaysia, Kenya, um, the United States and so on and so forth. So, uh, in that way, even if it is anonymous reporting uh, and we don't know that person, from our end, we are trying to introduce more uh, of these nudges that can help them feel that they are not alone. And I'm going to ask that uh, answer this question by Justin and then ask Ezra also to uh, answer it. For folks working closely with technology, is there an awareness or interest in open source? I wonder about potential to good versus doing harm with regards to public shared collaboration on mutually beneficial works or projects. So yes, so oh. when we started um, Safe City, it was on the Ushahidi platform, which was open source tech. 
However, since then, we found it to be very limiting. So that's how we've developed our platform. But our reporting platform is designed in a way where other nonprofits can have their own forms sitting on our reporting platform, thereby making it highly customizable for them at a fraction of the cost. The second is our data is crowdsourced and available open sourced for anyone to use. So we've had researchers using it from all different parts of the world because this kind of data is not available. We've had nonprofits use it when they are starting campaigns. We have police using it uh, in different parts of the country. And uh, all of this is not in a punitive manner, but preventive because using insights from this data as an added a layer of decision making really helps. Uh, about doing no harm, um, the methodology that we use at Red Dot is to partner with local nonprofits so that they can use the data in the way that they want for the solutions that they want and which is applicable to them. So what may work in one context cannot just be lifted and implemented in another context. It really has to have that buy-in and it is for the community to use this data to help further their understanding, have a dialogue. Like B. Leng said, um, one of the interesting um, uh, outcomes is not only police are the stakeholders that you bring in for solutions, the religious leaders are a highly untapped resource that one can use, which our partner in Kenya did. She brought in the religious leaders to talk to the men and boys. And that was very, very effective because it was the first time that the young men were being spoken to by an authority figure in their community and it had a big effect. So I'm gonna ask Ezra if she has any uh, insights as well on open source and then uh, do no harm. Sure, so for me, um, you know, I'm a big advocate of open source and I, I genuinely do believe that it's the, it's the backbone of the web. Um, it made so much of our work possible, affordable and sustainable. Um, so all the resources I sh are, uh, that I shared are built upon open source frameworks, whether it's the discourse platforms, Django, Ruby on Rails, um, and all the associated plugins that are built upon these platforms are also open source. Um, and sometimes when we build plugins, um, to, to support some of these uh, frameworks, we open source them as well to, to make other people kind of use and take advantage of them. Um, and so it, it also made it more secure because we're constantly building with a collective um, and constantly evolving and improving upon security in particular, rather than building these platforms and silos with little support and visibility. So I think, you know, um, open source frameworks um, continue to play a big role in the struggle against censorship because it has that additional layer of security compared to closed source um, tools that aren't being continuously audited. Um, so why more and more people, for example, are using Signal is that it is open source. And that was a major selling point for a lot of activists um, in particular beyond the promise of end-to-end -end encryption because they made it possible for people to hold them accountable to that promise of security um, and also help them build um, build upon it. So in our field, I do think that there is increasing awareness about the benefits of open source that far outweigh the, uh, the harms for the most part. Thank you for that. And I totally agree the, uh, the opportunities to use it for good far outweigh the opportunities for bad. Of course, technology can always be misused. So that is my last question to all my panelists. How can we use technology to include rather than exclude the experiences of vulnerable communities? And I will start with B. Lang. Um, yeah, that is um, actually a very challenging question. And I think the pandemic has actually pushed the society in general towards technology. We see the movement because people are in lockdown in uh, restricted movement and all that. We also see that uh, even the community itself, be it the B40 or the vulnerable groups, they are, they are uh, adopting technology. So I think in, in general, um, I mean, if you look at it, if the, the good part is that you know, the society is now shifting using technology, be it in learning, be it in, in, in working and all that. Uh, but also to be aware that 
the divide, the digital divide is there. And, and that is something that we have to be uh, mindful when we handle cases like this, because we cannot assume that the whole, uh, the, the, the whole society is actually moving towards technology. And, and we assume that people have access to all this, you know, the apps, if you need help, uh, you even talk about open source and all that. We must also be mindful about the, 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 the other group, which again, uh, I, I see there is uh, that segregation now. If you go to the low-cost flat, you go to the villages and all that, they already don't have a gadget. And secondly, uh, you talk about bandwidth, you know, do they again don't have those mobile data. So then you see that uh, even for cases of DV, how do they then reach out to, to for help if they don't have technology? So I think um, there may be some ways that, uh, the, again, going back to the community, if the community understand that this is a group of people who are more vulnerable and where they may be left behind, then more effort must be put to ensure that they are also safe. So yes, I think there must be a balance of high tech and the low tech. That is a human touch. It must be there. It cannot be everything about technology. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. Thank you, Bilang. And I really emphasize what you said that community is the key because in our work too, we have learned that in low income communities and in rural areas, uh, they don't have devices. They may not have a device. They may not be literate to use that device and they may not have internet connectivity. And then there's a language issue as well, right? So what we learned from our partner in Kenya and Nairobi is they use something called talking boxes. They place boxes in communities where people put little notes and somebody takes all those notes on a weekly basis and digitizes it. So our platform helped her digitize the data. And instead wow. of her looking at it one at a time and trying to make sense, once you have it in the digital format, you can then slice and dice the data. You can look at it on a map. You can uh, cluster it based on descriptors because in her in many slums or informal settlements google maps doesn't even work so you don't even have street names so descriptors like the pink moss the big building the whatever you know and so you can then look at that information and then um, figure out what are the solutions figure out who are the stakeholders that need to be brought into the room because again it's totally customizable to that location once you know what is going on where. So thank you for bringing and emphasizing the community. Uh, Lisa, what about you? Yeah, actually, Bilang, um, you, you really highlighted some key important points I wanted to bring up also in the context of our survey. Um, you know, because we too recognized um, the limitations of, you know, just sharing the survey via WhatsApp, via network. So, um, while technology, you know, like with uh, apps like the Safe City app provide that safe space to, safe space to report anonymously, um, you know, because we have issues of underreporting and, and it provides that sense of empowerment, it gives that voice and agency for people to share experiences, right? Um, this is, you know, the reality is that many, many groups are still left behind, you know, especially vulnerable communities, like you mentioned, B40 communities or persons with disabilities or the elderly. So this is a question of access, right? I mean, in order to be included, you need access to technology in terms of affordability, not just having the infinite internet structure, but also having a stable or strong data connection because a, a lack of that will hinder your um, access to information, to resources, to support. Um, and again, you know, part of that digital divide is digital literacy because you may have a device. Um, and you know, in the case of Malaysia, uh, our official statistics say that 90% have access to internet and almost 100% um, own a smartphone. And, and these are great. These are great stats. It may seem like there's actually really no issue, but um, you you know, people may not necessarily have the awareness and skills to use it optimally. So anyways, in the context of our study, what we did was um, to address the language barrier first we, and to um, reach a wider population, we did it in two languages, English and Malay. Malay is our national language and majority, you know, regardless of ethnic background, are familiar with Malay. 
Secondly, what we did, and like I um, mentioned earlier to Manu, is that you know we we circulated the survey among key NGOs and CSOs around the country, um, and we encouraged them to further circulate it within their communities. Just because we know that if we did it, uh, you know, just directly, with, we're only reaching those within arm's length, you know, um, within more of the urban areas, you know, in KL and Klang Valley. Um, thirdly, is that yeah, we were cognizant that. Um, by doing so, we may omit the valuable experiences of the B40 community who likely use public spaces more frequently. You know, whether it's walking to shops or taking the bus and the train to go to work to, or to go to school. Um, so while ideally we want to use technology, we, we must be flexible in adapting the methodologies that we employ. Um, and so one of the things that, um, you know, like I mentioned, even though most may have a smartphone, we have to consider the lived realities of the people from whom we wish to collect data from. So, you know, in the in the case of these um, groups from you know lower socioeconomic segments of society, they sometimes work two or more jobs. They've got a lot of household care responsibilities, looking after children and the elderly, and they have you know so they have other priorities rather than seeing a survey come on WhatsApp and actually answering that. Um, so the best approach for us was to actually go on the ground. We identified a particular area within Petaling Jaya, um, and we went into a low-cost housing area. We worked together with the block representatives there uh, to engage the families. Um, so we did this through an offline method in terms of the data collection. Um, uh, so the journey was a bit longer because it was so manual, um, but it was worth it because almost 80% cited um, domestic violence, um, around 63% cited um, sexual harassment. Yeah, so um, the other, sorry, just one more point is that this uh, local case study also managed to encompass um, the more elderly age group between like 40 to uh, 60 years old, and it also included persons with disabilities. Um, yeah, and, and sorry, Elsa, just one more thing is that following this, we have kept in touch. So this is another way in which we're using technology um, is that we are staying in touch with this um, community, with the block reps through WhatsApp, um, where we continuously share updates, information, resources for them uh, to, to share with their wider residential groups. Thank you for sharing. How about you, Ezra? Yeah, so for me, it's also about um, embracing collectives, um, inviting collaboration and designing for um, accessibility. And, um, you know, I would agree with everyone else about the digital divide. Um, and another point is that it's, it's also important to support digital infrastructure, because a lot of the times funders don't provide resources to support technology itself, because they don't see it as a program specific expense. Um, but as you all know, you know, technology has very deep costs, you know, hosting, development, maintenance, um, catching up with a constantly changing landscape of technology. Um, this was our biggest challenge in building our work and also the reason we had to shut down many platforms that were resource intensive. Um, you know, we had a crowdsourcing platform that curated millions of data on social justice movements and the, you know, the hosting cost just became unbearable. And uh, because tech companies don't support many nonprofits abroad with in-kind donations, they mostly focus on global North nonprofits, especially in the US or EU. Um, so we have less access to these types of um, resources. And we're also highly taxed because they don't recognize, you know, nonprofit statuses in certain places around the world. Um, so that's why, um, without that recognition that we can't sometimes legally register in our countries and our context due to those, um, due to legal restrictions and security concerns. Um, so the access to these tech resources are very unequal. And without this, um, you know, without more resources towards infrastructure, we can't genuinely be, you know, uh, inclusive and who gets to build um, platforms. So I think um, these obstacles would definitely have to be challenged on an international scale um, for us to really be a lot more equal, inclusive and accessible in, in the creation of tech and the usage of tech um, and just um, ensuring that um, we are not just users of um, traditional tools, but also creators um, of tools as well. You raised such important points, Ezra, I can't tell you. So 
at safe city we started off with only the tech but we had to branch out into other services to raise funds which is uh, the workshops that we do on understanding sexual and uh, gender based violence and how do you uh, you know what are your legal rights how do you formally report if you don't want to formally report how can data set like safe city help you and it's a distraction you know part of the social audit which i didn't show you but which is part of the larger um, group is initially we had a larger number of reports that came in and then it kind of dwindled in a way and that's because our time and effort was busy trying to raise funds we don't have donors who directly fund the tech so how is the uh, the tech going to fund itself we can't expect the users who are going through such personal trauma to pay for reporting their own experiences so obviously you have to raise funding from different sources which is time intensive as well having said that a lot of the data has come through these personal workshops because that's how we've designed our programs that it still feeds in back to the tech and but you know you're right it doesn't allow us to just focus on the tech and then you get asked you know but you're not based in the us but you're not based here so who gets to develop these solutions and why can't you know great solutions come from the global south like ushahidi as well you know so uh, i think there's a lot for the global north to learn from us in the global south i hate those terms anyway you know who gets to uh call us the global south but um having said that i think all of us have presented great solutions great initiatives and um i hope that this um uh, session was insightful to the ones listening it will be available in a recording do check our websites out i've put it all there and uh, in the chat section so you can have a look at it and uh, maybe we can engage in further conversations on how we can learn from each other so thank you for joining and uh, thank you to uh, engender consultancy uh, radhya from sisterhood alliance lata from develop matrix that did our social audit vital voices voices against violence under the state department ben b lang ong and ezra for uh, you know sharing their words of wisdom all of you have been wonderful thank you oh, so are we taking a group photo yes i have already taken a screenshot but i will now um, you know just do a gallery view of everyone so if you want to put on your video um if you don't want to put on your video that's fine but if you want to put on your video please do so now and i'm going to take a screenshot so 1 2 3 your best smiles please okay one more screen 1 2 3 3 i'm just now seeing there are such wonderful uh, people out here i can see our vital voices colleagues jennifer guzman also is here hi jennifer so the program has officially ended i am going to start